see everybody back from your coffee break, and uh, I imagine this is what makes our program unique. They, they see these coffee cups and they wonder what in the world's going on. The other thing is this blackboard. They flip through the channels and they see the blackboard and they think, wait a minute, what was that? And then they see, I get all this in the mail. And then they back up and uh, they watch a little longer. And, you know, we're, we're pretty confident. If we can just get people to watch five minutes, they'll, uh, they'll usually stay with it. So anyway, we want to always thank our television audience for your letters, your prayers, your financial help. Without it, we would never last. And uh, we just know the Lord is providing it through all of you out there. And we thank you so much for your letters. And, uh, of course, we always emphasize, keep them as short as possible. And uh, the shorter they are, the more we can read, and we do. We like to uh, make the claim that we read every letter that comes into the ministry. And uh, if you keep them short, that makes it easier. All right, for those of you here in the studio audience, we are now ready to get into chapter 59. I'm going to chap skip chapter 58 and go into chapter 59. While you're looking that up, I'll remind our TV audience also that we are now in book number 62. And if you multiply that times 12, that tells us we've produced over 700 of these programs. Doesn't seem possible, does it, Kenneth? And uh, Luther, you guys have been with us since the beginning. And uh, it's unbelievable. And Louise, I don't imagine you've missed more than one or two either, have you? Okay, for those of you out in television then, let's just jump in at... Chapter 59 of Isaiah, verse 1. First word, behold. In other words, pay attention. The Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither is his ear, his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. Now, I'm sure many of you have been aware of that verse most of your life. You probably didn't know where it was, but you've heard it. Well, what does it mean? Listen, God is always ready to extend salvation to the person who is ready to believe. But see, this was Israel's problem. They wanted nothing to do with God. They wanted to do their own thing. In fact, a verse just comes to mind. I hope I'm still in the right place. I didn't even think of when I was preparing for this. But come back with me. I think it's the last verse of the book of Judges. I hope that's where it's at. The last verse of the book of Judges. That would be what? Chapter... Yeah, chapter 21 of Judges. And this is 700 years before Isaiah. <laughs> so you see, people don't change. Isn't it amazing? I think I made the comment in our last taping. Why did God call out Israel and told them that they were to be different? Well, to prove the point that even though they're different, they're all the same. You know, the evolutionist has a little cliche that they like to use, that the more things go by, the more they stay the same. Well, there's a certain amount of truth in that that people do not change. The human race is driven by the old satanic, Adamic nature, and it's been that way now for almost 6,000 years. But look at Israel now, 700 years before Isaiah, who was 700 years before Christ. So actually, this is 1,400 years before Christ, and uh, just uh, a little while after the law was given to Moses. Last verse of Judges 21. And this just says it all. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. What do they call that today in modern technology? Situation ethics. <laughs> if you're comfortable with it, do it. Well, that's what Israel was doing way back here. And listen, God has never given man that kind of freedom. He has never given us the freedom to just do whatever our old Adamic nature tells us to do. And yet Israel was so guilty of that very thing all through their national existence. All right, come back with me then, if you will, to Isaiah 59. But in spite of their rebellion, in spite of their unbelief, was God ready to save the man who would believe? Sure he was. 
Were his ears stopped up that he could not hear? Never. And even today, as the world is steeped, again, in high-tech iniquity, that's about what all it amounts to. It's the same old immorality that was back in antiquity, only now it's associated with high technology, but it's the same old stuff. Is God unable to hear the cry of the person for salvation? No. God's ears aren't stopped today any more than it was in the days of Isaiah. All right, now verse 2. But, flip side, even though God is willing to save any Jew or Israelite that would have wanted to be obedient to what God has said, he was ready. Flip side, this is where they really were. But your iniquities, their sin, their wickedness, have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid your, his face from you that he will not hear. Well, now even today. Do you hear much about sin anymore? Mm -mm. You hardly ever hear anything about sin. Oh, we may decry some of the acts of some people, but to just simply call it sin, most preachers are afraid to use the word. But it's always been the dilemma that keeps mankind from a relationship with God. It's their sin, see? All right, so your sins, your iniquities, have hid his face from you that he will not hear. It wasn't God's fault. God was listening. God was ready for their cry. But they were so steeped in their sin that God didn't even enter their thinking. Now, verse 3, your hands are defiled with blood. Murder didn't even bother them. Your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. Now, I know that we may be getting kind of tired of this throughout the whole book of Isaiah. But the reason I'm staying with it is because we're in the same dilemma in America today. And I still like to make that parallel, even though Scripture doesn't, because America was unknown in Scripture. But I do feel that there is a parallel that you and I can use. Because not only was Israel God's chosen people, he was under their promises, but our beloved land was established by godly men on biblical principles. In fact, I told somebody the other day, whenever you hear the media and you hear these liberals decrying the word of God someplace or in the courthouse, when Iris and I were in Washington, D.C. a few years ago, I think we hit just about every monument in town. And the thing that amazed me the most was that even the monument of Thomas Jefferson, who was probably the least spiritual of all of our founding fathers, even in the Jefferson Memorial, scripture verse after scripture verse after scripture verse. And then this all came to mind. I was reading an article the other night about the Washington Monument, the big tall spire. Well, we weren't able to go when we were there because it was under renovation and it was closed, but it's now open again. And this article revealed that at the very pinnacle of the spire that stands on top of the National Mon Monument is something makes direct reference to God. That's what America was founded on. And every memorial in Washington, D.C. is saturated with scripture verses. You go into Lincoln Memorial and it's all over the place. And then they try to tell us that we're to have nothing to do with Scripture in public places. They're going to have to sandblast most of Washington. <laughs> but see, here's where we have come. We've come under the influence of these people that want to take God and the Word of God out of every segment of life because of this stupid statement, separation of church and state. Our founding fathers never intended to separate God from government. All they said was that the religious entities were not to control government, and we certainly all agree to that. I don't want any particular denomination to have clout over government, but I certainly see nothing wrong with government realizing their responsibility under God. He's sovereign, and that's the way he intended it to be. All right, so Israel, you see, is just a good illustration of where we are as a nation today. And it's the same thing. Why you can just constantly make, make comparisons. Verse 4. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity. See that which appeals to the flesh? And they speak 
Lies. My, guess the place they can tell a lie and get called on it tomorrow? Doesn't bother them. And they conceive mischief, bring forth iniquity. Now here, another allegory, if I can call it that. They hatch cockatrice's eggs. Now, I don't know what a cockatrice egg would taste like, but I don't imagine it's very good. And they weave the spider's web. See the analogy here? He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. These are all just illustrations in language that no one can say, well, I don't know what he's talking about. It's obvious. It spells nothing but trouble. All right, their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Now, what's that a reference to? Adam and Eve, after they had first eaten, what'd they do? They went and sowed fig leaves. And they thought they could cover their nakedness. Did they? No, it didn't, it didn't hold water with God. Their nakedness wasn't covered until he provided the skins of animals back in chapter 3. But this is all a reference, see? That just as ridiculous as sowing fig leaves by Adam and Eve, so also the Israelites are trying to cover themselves with false works. But they're works of iniquity and the act of violence. Now remember, whenever you see the word violence in Scripture, what are we talking about? Murder. Murder. All right? Reading on. Verse 7. Their feet run to evil, and they make her haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their path. Well, I mean, it's just one thing after none. Now let's see how Paul puts it. Now let's jump up to Roman. I don't want to stay in the Old Testament. Otherwise, someone will say, well, Les, I get tired of you being in the Old Testament too much. No, we're going to jump back and forth. Now let's just come up to Romans a minute. Romans chapter 1. And see if there's much difference in 700 and some years of time. Well, you know as well as I do. Not a bit. It's the same old human race. All right, let's drop in at Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Romans 1, verse 28. This could almost be Isaiah writing to Israel. In fact, I think he even quotes a couple here out of Isaiah. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And even as they, ungodly people, did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient or normal. Now here it comes. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, now, this is Paul writing. This isn't Isaiah. <laughs> this is Paul. Debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. My goodness. Can't get much worse than that, can it? But what is it? That's the picture of the human race until they experience God's saving grace. All right, come back again to Isaiah. This is all just to show us that the human race is incorrigibly wicked because they are under the old Adamic nature. All right, back to Isaiah 59. Verse 8. Isaiah 59, now verse 8. The way of peace, like we looked at in the last program. <clears throat> Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have no fear of being brought into his presence because our sins have been forgiven. But Israel didn't have that. They have no peace. There is no judgment. Now, the word judgment, as, as I understand in the Old Testament, is that kind of rule that brings tranquility. In other words, that's the whole purpose of government in the first place, to guarantee the peace and safety of the civilian population. All right? 
So there is no government of that type in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. <laughs> Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. But like we saw earlier in the chapter, they're going to be in constant turmoil. Verse 9, therefore is judgment, or that kind of a fair government, is far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. And I'm going to repeat the verb, we wait for brightness, but we walk where? In darkness. Now verse 10, this is the spiritual description again of Israel and America. We grope for the wall like the blind. Now that can't be improved on, can it? That's as plain as you can picture it, how a blind person just gropes to figure out where he is. All right? And that's what Israel was. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as if it were the middle of the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. What a horrible picture of the nation. We roar like bears and mourn sore like doves. You know, whenever I read Old Testament 7, you know what I'm always amazed? The language is the same as you'd use today. What does a bear do when, when they're trapped? You know, Iris and I had first had understanding of that. We stopped with a couple in, uh, outside of Yellowstone Park a few years ago. And they'd had a big bi a grizzly and her two cubs come into their front yard and eaten out of their apple tree. So they called for the park people. They were right on the outside of Wellstone Park. So they called for the park people. And they came and they set a trap. And the old mama bear went in first. And so, of course, the gate slapped on her. But they couldn't get the cubs. And so for almost 48 hours, that old mama bear just roared and <laughs> roared. They said you couldn't sleep at night for the roaring of that old mama bear. Well, I read something like this, and I can't help but think of something like that. That was Israel, like a trapped mama. Now, why did she roar? Her babies are up there in the apple tree, and she knew it. And so here's, here's the connotation. Israel, in their unbelief and in their wickedness, was just like a roaring bear. And then the other one is like doves. What kind of doves? Morning doves. And with their mournful song. And so between the two, you had the extreme on both ends. That was Israel. But that's America. I can't help but bringing the two together. All right? Read on. But there is none. There is no sensible government or judgment. For salvation... It is far off from us. God's fault? No, we already saw that his ears aren't stopped. His arm isn't shortened. So whose fault is it? Unbelieving Israel. And today is no different. Why are people groping in their spiritual blindness? Because that's where they want to be. That's where they choose to be. They don't have to. God is ready and willing He's constantly on the alert. You remember way back in one of my earlier programs, I gave the illustration of a swimming pool full of kids on a hot summer afternoon. And if you've got a lifeguard that knows what he or she is doing in the midst of all that screaming and laughing, and everything, if there's one little weak cry of a kid in trouble, they hear it and they're after him. Well, that's gone. In the midst of all the turmoil of this world, his ear is still tender for the cry of a lost person seeking salvation. And he's there instantly. All right, reading on. Our transgressions in verse 12 are, with, are against us. Our transgressions are, I'm sorry, our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them. Verse 13, in transgressing and lying against the Lord, departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, instead of dwelling on things that were honest and true and along the lines of godliness, they were totally the opposite. Now another New Testament scripture comes to mind. Let's go all the way up to Titus. Let's go all the way to Titus chapter 2. And this again is Paul writing to you and I. 
Even as believers, we have to be on constant guard against these thoughts that will take us in the wrong direction. And after all, remember, where does everything begin? In the thought. Everything has to start with a thought. And that's why we have to be constantly aware. All right, Titus chapter 2, starting at verse 11. And I love these verses. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Wait and see that everybody's found it. Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Now remember what we just heard in Isaiah? His arm is not shortened. His ears are not closed. Well, it's the same way here. God's grace has appeared to every human being one way or another. Now then, verse 12, what does the grace of God teach you and I as believers? It's teaching us that we're to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, the lusts of the flesh. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Now that's a small g. We're to live godly lives. Now, that just simply means in absence of sinful living. And we are to live all of these things in this present world. You don't have to wait to get old of eternity for this. This is the here and now. And how many church people can sit in church on Sunday morning and yet the rest of the week know nothing of this? And Israel was saying, oh, they kept their temple worship. Oh, it had already been counterfeited, and it had been adulterated, but oh, they still were religious. But there was no faith connected with it. They thought more of their, their wickedness than they did of pleasing God. All right, back to Isaiah 59. Now verse 14. Judgment. And again, I'm still going to use that definition. Judgment referred to a a governmental authority that would bring peace and happiness to its people. All right? Judgment is turned away backward. They don't even want that which is good for them. And justice standeth afar off. You now, every once in a while, we'll have one of our listeners write that have gone through a court situation for whatever reason, and invariably... Was justice served? Mm -mm. Too often it isn't. And you know why? Because too many of our judges are corrupt. And if you've got a corrupt judge, justice will not be served. And so here's what's happening in Israel, the same thing. You couldn't find justice. There wasn't anything fair. If you weren't part and parcel of the murdering crowd and the lying crowd, you, you just couldn't survive. And we're getting there so fast ourselves. All right, back to Isaiah 59. Verse 14 again. Judgment is turned away backward. Justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street. Isn't that beautiful? My, that just says it like it is. Truth is something that's walked underfoot. It's fallen in the street. And equity, fairness, cannot enter. Yea, truth Faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself what? A prey. You stand for that which is right in Israel at this time, and you were probably murdered for it. They couldn't stand you. Well, in some areas of our country, it's already that way. You stand up for truth, and you won't last long. Sorry state of affairs, isn't it? All right, reading on. And the Lord saw it, verse 15, reading on, and it displeased him that there was no judgment or fair system of rule. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor, not even the like of an Isaiah. <clears throat> Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. 
And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. All right, now there again, let's go back and see how Paul puts it in the last chapter of Ephesians. Same language, the same illustration, and now here is Paul during this age of grace comparing the situation with Israel in the time of Isaiah. And with this, we can just about come to the end of our program. Ephesians chapter 6, and let's drop in at verse 11. No, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And this is still appropriate for us today, just as it was for Israel 700 B.C. Verse 10, Ephesians 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or all the devices of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, not in the pew, in the places of spiritual and denominational authority. All right, now then, here he quotes almost from Isaiah. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, you may be able to withstand, having done all stand, your loins girt about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet, verse 15, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, whereby ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And now look at verse 17. Word for word from Isaiah. And take the helmet of salvation. Why does he emphasize the helmet? Because under the helmet is the what? The brain, the mind, the very source of all of our activity. See? And so you take the helmet of salvation as well as the sword of the Spirit. And what's the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. This is our weapon. But this weapon does nothing unless you have everything upstairs that you need. And how do we get that? Through the leading and the directing of the Holy Spirit. And we depend on Him for all of our needs. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.